Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by me, the Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad, and I'm joining from Dubai, and I'll be moderating today's lecture by Nervous System. If this is your first time joining us on Live Academy, allow me to give you a brief introduction about what we've been doing. Lab Academy was born as a lockdown project, uh, which we've created in the past few months, connecting people from all over the world to share, exchange ideas and share their technical skills. The program is aimed at decentralizing access to avant-garde ideas in design and computation. For the live sessions in semester two and throughout the month of July, we've created a roster of speakers giving lectures on their work, as well as experts giving classes on software. So make sure that you visit our website to register for the upcoming sessions. So again, today's lecture is by Nervous System, joining us from Catskill. So Jessica and Jesse are based over there in New York, and the lecture is also being broadcasted on YouTube Live. So if you can make the Zoom registration, you can also watch it there. If you've also missed it completely, you can watch the recording later on on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to that. If you'd like to get access to the previous beginner classes that we've hosted on Live Academy, feel free to visit liveacademy.tv and the host will be posting all these links and pin them to the chat uh, at some point in the stock. So again, today's lecture is by a duo that have embraced nature as a source of inspiration for their generative design approach. Nervous System pioneered the idea of end user bespoke customization and have contributed to generative design community with works that range in scale and function. Founded in 2007 by Jessica Rosenkratz and Jesse Lewis Rosenberg, Nervous System have pioneered the application of new technologies in design, including the generative systems, 3D printing, and WebGL. Nervous System released online design applications that enable customers to co-create products in an effort to make the design more accessible. And their designs have been featured in a wide range of publications, including Wired, The New York Times, The Guardian, Metropolis, and Forbes. Jesse and Jessica have given talks on their generative design process on many forums, including MIT, Harvard, SIGGRAPH, and the IO Festival. Their work is part of the permanent collection of the museums of many museums around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, Jessica graduated from MIT in 2005 and holds a degree in architecture and biology. Afterwards, she studied architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and taught design at MIT. Jesse studied math at MIT and previously worked at Gary Technologies in building modeling and design automation. So joining me from Catskill, New York, Jesse, and Jessica from a nervous system. Please give them a warm welcome. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Appreciate the, the warm, welcoming atmosphere. We've been quarantined here in uh, upstate New York since March. So it's always exciting to connect with some people, even uh, through the internet. Okay, so I think we're going to share our screen now. Hopefully, this goes as planned. Surprisingly, we haven't actually done that many uh, Zoom things in our time yet. Mostly been cloistered in our studio, sort of making products. Okay, so we're gonna give a lecture now. So as you just heard, we started Nervous System back in 2007, and Jesse and I were both still students. We wanted to use Nervous System as a creative outlet for sort of weird cross-disciplinary experiments that didn't really fit into the structure of our education. Jesse was studying uh, math and computer science. I was studying architecture and biology. And we wanted to make a studio where we could um, seamlessly combine techniques from these very different disciplines. Nervous system is a strange mashup of design studio, research lab, artist duo, software consultancy, and lifestyle brands. And we work in many different materials and make a myriad of different products. We make jewelry, clothes, furniture, lamps, jigsaw puzzles, and even sometimes architecture. Um, everything that we make though is generated by software that we write. And what we're really interested in is how computation can change the way we approach design. So as an example, this is an application that we created in 2010. And what we're interested in is sort of creating new types of playful design experiences that leverage simulation and web technology to make it possible for anybody to create. So here you can see sort of a live website where a customer can come sort of sculpt 
form their own design within this family and sort of wanted to make it as easy and accessible as possible while still being open-ended and have room for people to sort of create their own expressions. So it's really sort of more like a video game than like a CAD software. You don't need to have like a lot of experience with engineering or design. You have to figure out how to make certain pieces of geometry meet up with other pieces of geometry or focusing more on these high level ideas like density and movement and shape and fit. And we also wanted to make it easy to, you know, look at different materials, sort of price is updated on the fly based on how you change the design to make it as seamless as possible. So our work is very inspired by the complex patterns and forms that we see in nature. We're interested in how these patterns emerge from processes um, that includes biological, physical, chemical, and geological systems. And it's really fascinating how you see very similar types of patterns across many diverse phenomena. We create generative software, which takes inspiration from nature's process-based designs, and we focus on developing interactive processes that we can engage with. Instead of creating static designs, we create these dynamic systems. And instead of drawing structures, what we're interested in at Nervous System is growing them. So for this talk, we're gonna go through three different projects that kind of hit on how we use computation kind of augment design in different ways. The first project is called Kinematics, and it's a project where we fuse fashion, software, and 3D printing to examine how digital fabrication and generative design can impact the way we create clothing. And we're interested in how we can leverage these tools for customization and personalization. So we started thinking about how 3D printers could be used to create new types of textiles. This might sound weird at first, but textiles are actually human constructions. They're raw materials that have been transformed to have very different behaviors based on how they're arranged in space. If you think about the behavior of like a knit textile versus a woven textile, that different structuring can almost have more effect than whether it's made of, let's say, wool or cotton. And 3D printing offers interesting opportunities to make even more complex arrangements in space and what sort of and meta materials and sort of functions can we create using this new technology. And in fact, computation has a long history in textiles as well. The Jacker loom, which was first demonstrated in 1801, use, was the first machine to use punch cards to encode intricate weaving instructions. And you wouldn't necessarily call this a computer, but these weaving machines were a very important precursor to the first computers. So we can see textiles as sort of these computationally mediated materials. For our textile, we started off with sort of the simplest idea we had about how to make something that was flexible with 3D printing. So we created this sort of triangulated hinged based structure. 3D printers normally print rigid materials, but by structuring our design with these interlocking hinges, we we're able to create things that behave and move more like a fabric. We wanted to create a textile that's material properties could vary through space um, in terms of rigidity, porosity, shape, and drape. We started to play with this idea of making small scale pieces like what you see on the screen. These were essentially necklaces that we could print all in one piece on our MakerBot 3D printer. And we're really fascinated by these, how they have a kind of hybrid behavior. They're both rigid and soft. And I started to dream about, can I make something like this, but much larger, like a full dress? How would that feel? How would it move? Um, but you immediately run into a problem. We were making small things like a necklace because that's what fits in our printer. How do we make something as large as a garment? Um, so we had an idea that maybe we could take advantage of the fact that the structures we're making are flexible. Maybe we could use the fact that they can move in order to find a smaller configuration for them that they can be printed in. Um, so this sort of changes the entire way you might think about making a garment. If you can make a garment all in one piece without uh, having to decompose it into flat panels and having to painstakingly sew it together, then you can 
think about designing it directly from the body. So what if we start directly from a 3D scan of your body? We have a sort of online application where anybody can customize their garments and then we can make a fully customized garment that can emerge from the printer ready to wear without ever having to be cut, sewn, or assembled. Wait, wait, don't change the slide yet. It's the best part. <laughs> So this is like sort of a, a concept video that we made early on in this project just to express the idea of, you know, can we make these customized garments and then shrink them computationally and then fabricate them in this shrunken form. And what sort of opportunities does that open up for different types of textiles that have these more variable behaviors. So as Jessica just said, we sort of created this, this concept video and this idea, but there were a lot of steps along the way to turn that idea into a reality. And there's sort of all these different challenges of the process from the fabrication to the design to sort of 3D scanning and creating bodies and fit. And then finally, this sort of simulation uh, can we actually compress these garments into a fabricable form? So the first sort of step was kind of very basic of just designing these hinge structures and trying to optimize them as much as possible for fabrication. So really, we just spent a bunch of time modeling sort of dozens of different hinges, trying to make them as small as possible while still being robust enough to wear. Once we sort of hit upon a hinge that seemed to work uh, reliably uh, with the printing tolerances of selective laser centering, which is the printing technology we're working with, we decided to just start by testing our idea small. <laughs> Um, so we designed a necklace, we crumpled it up using our simulation, and then we printed it, and that worked. So we figured, okay, let's scale up. What's next? Then we made a belt. We took just like a really bad Kinect 3D scan of my stomach, and then we used that to generate a belt structure, crumpled it, and printed it. That worked, but this one was the first one where we started to test the idea of like comfort and fit, scaled up again. This is where we started to have some problems, actually. We designed a bodice, which now had thousands of interconnected components. And that's the point at which it really started to tax the software that we created, which worked out that it worked really well on things with only dozens of panels or hundreds, like the belt or the necklace. But when it got to simulating something with thousands of rigid panels, it started to choke and completely fail. So actually, at this point, we sort of had to remake this software from scratch to deal with these larger systems, but we got there and printed this and it also sort of worked the first time, which, you know, we we're sort of very lucky along this process that we, we kept sort of scaling up and scaling up and every time it, it worked. And while we were going through this prototyping process, we were also sort of building out the design aspect of it because all these prototypes we made weren't made in any sort of user interface or software that anybody could use. They were just built using sort of software that had no user interface. It just created a basically blank screen and spit out a file for printing. So here we created another online application using WebGL where the user can input their body and then sculpt a dress on that body. They can change the silhouette and then they can change the pattern, they can change the density of the structure and paint on different module styles. So we designed sort of these different modules that you can apply in different areas, be porosity or solid areas. And one of the things that we really care about when we're creating these design applications is that you, know, you can save and share designs. So you can make something for your body, save it, and then somebody else can load and modify and create their own variation on that design. 
Another set of issues that we were dealing with while working on this project is the questions of bodies and fit. So like, what does it really mean for something to fit you? And how do we actually capture the shape of a person's body in order to make garments that fit? 3D scanners, while they're increasingly prevalent in depth cameras like the Microsoft Connect and even using Google's cell phone cameras, um, we were hoping that we could use these affordable tools as scanners that would help us with this project. However, there's lots of problems with 3D scans. They can be extremely glitchy, noisy, and unpredictable. Areas that are shadowed will appear like holes in the final geometry that's generated. And additionally, there's larger questions like how do you make semantic sense of the data you receive? Like how do you identify where somebody's armpit is? How do you know where their neck is or their waist? These are all things that make a difference in a piece of clothing. But a 3D scan doesn't immediately know what that data is. So we were fortunate that while we were working on this project, we actually met a group that was solving this exact problem called body lineups. And they created a parametric body model based on machine learning. This is actually before sort of the whole blow up of neural nets and machine learning now, where you could input either measurements or a scan, and they would create a body model based on that that was parametric and poseable so that you could take a body, put it in whatever position you want, and identify different points on the body that correspond between different shapes. So using this allowed us to design on top of that and map a design from one person's body to anybody else's body. The last sort of uh, block of the project was a simulation, uh, which is sort of like the cornerstone that it's built around. Can we actually simulate the behavior of these structures that have you know, up to like 6,000 interlocking rigid parts in order to reduce their size for 3D printing? Initially, we had envisioned just crumpling up the dress to fit it in the volume of the printer, but we quickly realized that wasn't the most efficient. Like when you go to put clothes in your dresser, you actually just fold them up. Or if you're packing for a trip, you fold things nicely and you're able to save space more efficiently that way. So we actually decided to take an approach similar to that for the garment. We sort of just collide the dress essentially with a series of rigid bodies in order to fold it uh, in a precise way. And that reduces the size dramatically for printing. So in addition, in addition to using the simulation to fold the garment, we can use it to do more stuff, like understand how the garments are going to drape and move. So because these garments have these very non-uniform structures that are varying sort of in size, so you can see when you drape them, they have these sort of unexpected behaviors of different areas acting and draping differently. We can use the simulation tool to study and understand that before we decide which dresses we want to print. So the first dress that we ever printed was uh, actually made for the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, we had met a curator from the museum, Paula Antonelli, who had seen that video we showed earlier on, the concept video. And she expressed that she would potentially be interested in acquiring one of the dresses for the museum's permanent collection. Um, I don't know if she realized that we'd never actually made a dress, that it was like just a concept video, and we weren't sure if it was actually going to work or not. Um, but we sort of set ourselves to the task of actually making one of these garments real. And this video was filmed at Shapeways Factory in New York City, um, basically like the day before they needed it for this MoMA meeting that only happens twice a year. As you can tell, initially the dress was like extremely stiff, and that's because the printing method we use, selective laser sintering, uses a laser to fuse together nylon powder. And inside of each hinge, there's still this uncentered loose nylon powder that has to be shaken out before the garment can start to move. But kind of at that point, we didn't know if it worked or not, or if that powder was fused and, and it was going to be fact, like totally like ruined. Two weeks before this, we had done our first test that was actually a total failure and had come out completely fused. So we sort of needed this to work. All right, um, but luckily it did actually work and we were able to make the garments uh, come out of the printer wearable. So this is the first dress that we made. It's an intricately patterned structure of more than uh, 2,200 unique triangular panels interconnected by 3,300 hinges. And it's all 3D printed as a single piece of fabric in nylon. And while every component is totally rigid in aggregate, it's able to sort of flexibly conform, conform and move with body movement. 
Unlike traditional fabric, the textile is not uniform. It varies in rigidity, drape, flex, porosity, and pattern throughout space. And the entire piece is customizable from fit and style to flexibility and pattern. We've sort of done many further explorations on this project. This is a sort of um, petal like skinning system that we created for later kinematics dresses. Where you can have a sort of directional layer um, that still sort of flows and moves on top of the underlying structure. And then we've also done sort of further explorations on this idea of creating garments that we can simulate to create for fabrication. And this is an example of a chainmail like structure where we created for form labs because they uh, created a sort of affordable SLS machine, which has a much smaller build volume. So we needed to create a garment that could compress even further. Yeah. So this one, the chainmail is kind of boring, but the cool thing about it is it fits into like a box, like yay big. I don't know if anybody can see me, but it's sort of like a bread box, loaf of bread sized shirt. Okay. So now we're going to talk about another project. So this project is about jigsaw puzzles and kind of this idea of using computation and digital fabrication to reinterpret a traditional craft. So this is how most people know jigsaw puzzles. They're these cardboard die cut puzzles. They're very repetitive. The same die is often used for different puzzles. So they all have the same pieces. And, you know, we, we all grew up with jigsaw puzzles and love jigsaw puzzles, but these are sort of very simple, repetitive shapes. And in fact, what less people know about is kind of the history behind jigsaw puzzles, where jigsaw puzzles traditionally were handcrafted cut on a scroll saw out of wood, sort of started with these map based puzzles and developed into this entire art where different cutters all had their own style. It made very complex pieces, often incorporating thematic shapes that we call whimsies, where you might have a piece that's the shape of a ship or a dancer. And a lot of this uniqueness and artistry was lost with the advent of mass production. And so we were interested in how can we bring back this spirit and artistry and jigsaw puzzles in our own way, using digital fabrication and computational systems. So our starting inspiration was this ammonite fossil, where ammonites are an extinct cephalopod related to a nautilus, so they're a spiral shell. But the interesting thing about them is, unlike a nautilus, which has these smooth sort of partitions in their shell, ammonites have partitions known as sutures that look like this. They're these amazingly intricate structures. And we saw these and thought these would make really cool jigsaw puzzles. So we started looking at ways of modeling this sort of system. One of the difficulties is that ammonites have been extinct for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. So nobody actually knows how or even why these patterns form. But we can look at a lot of similar patterns in nature that are well studied and come up with sort of inspirations for ways to model these kinds of patterns. One of the systems that we learned about that we thought made very similar looking patterns is something called a Hella Shaw cell. It's a really like cool, simple experiment you can do at home just with like two panes of glass and two liquids of differing viscosities. So here we're injecting um, water into glycerin or air into glycerin apparently in this video. And the extreme difference in the viscosity of these two fluids leads to the emergence of these branching patterns in a phenomenon called viscous fingering. Another example is a form of crystal growth called dendritic solidification, which often occurs in supercooled fluids. And 
this system has an advantage of it has a very well studied computational models which are tractable, which can be solved relatively quickly, which is something that's important for us as designers. We need to work with systems that are fast enough that we can iterate and explore and sort of create design systems that we can use. And so the basic sort of layout of our, our puzzle generation software. So we create all of our cuts for these jigsaw puzzles using custom software. And the idea being that, you know, just like an artist who cuts jigsaw puzzles by hand makes a unique shape every time, our puzzles grow a unique shape every time computationally. So we start by just laying out pieces and then we grow the edges using this simulation of inverted simplification to create interlocking structures. One of the sort of interesting challenges in this project was sort of extending this idea of dendritic solidification to something that would work for puzzle pieces. Because in the real world, you have a solid and a liquid, and the solid is sort of growing into the liquid. But in our puzzle world, we actually have hundreds of pieces that are all sort of growing into each other simultaneously. So instead of having a straight liquid solid boundary, you sort of need to break the physical inspiration and create a system where each piece is its own sort of phase of matter that is all growing simultaneously. So we use the system that we created uh, to create a series of one-of-a-kind jigsaw puzzles. So just like the puzzles that we were inspired by, traditional wooden puzzles, every puzzle we make is unique. They also each have a completely unique piece of artwork that's generated by Jonathan McCabe, who's an amazing generative artist who works um, a lot with reaction diffusion and um, fluid flow systems together. And then the puzzles are all laser cut at our studio, uh, previously in Boston, but now in the Catskills out of plywood. So these were the first puzzles we made, I don't know, it must have been like seven years ago at, th at this point that we did this series of puzzles. Since then, we've continued to explore ways in which we can um, use generative techniques and digital fabrication to really extend what's possible with jigsaw puzzles. So this is a series we created a couple of years ago called Geode, where not only do we have unique pieces and a unique image, but every puzzle also has a completely different shape. So we're inspired by slices of agate stone to grow these sort of banded um, patterns of color. And then each one ends up having a unique shape and a unique set of pieces. And here we also have this new style of puzzle piece, which we call maze, which is grown in a, a different way. There's sort of uh, springy edges you see here, which are extending and extending and extending. And as they do that, they bump into each other and intertwine into these incredibly sort of spindly pieces. And then another thing that we started to try to do is what can we do using these techniques that would be difficult or even impossible to do by hand? So one of the limitations of hand cut puzzles is basically the only way for two pieces to have a tight fit is to physically cut them apart. And traditional puzzle makers have developed all sorts of really cool techniques to create what are called trick puzzles that can be assembled in multiple ways by taking multiple pieces and cutting them simultaneously. But ultimately you have that sort of hard constraint of physically cutting things apart. But with the precision and reproducibility of digital fabrication, we can make two cuts in completely different pieces of material and combine them together seamlessly. So this is a puzzle that we created that we call the challenge puzzle that was sort of exploring ideas of creating a super hard puzzle. So it has no image, it has no sort of hard boundary, and then it has a puzzle within the puzzle. So all of the colored pieces pull out and form a sub puzzle as well. 
So with the challenge puzzle that Jesse just showed you, we were playing with the idea of having no edge on the puzzle, like there wasn't a straight edge. However, there still sort of was an edge to the puzzle. Um, the reason that we took away the edge is that's where you normally start the puzzle. So we thought by having no edge, we'd make it harder. Um, but we started to think about, could we truly make a puzzle that has no boundary? What if it tiles? So pieces on one edge connect to the other side and pieces from the top connect to the bottom. Um, this would be something that would be very challenging to do by hand, because it's just, just described, you basically have to take a saw blade and cut apart two things to make them work. But in computation world, it's very easy to make a tiling puzzle. We can sort of just create periodic boundary conditions. So then we started to think about, you know, what does it mean to have a tiling puzzle? And what are other ways that we can sort of push this idea further? So we took inspiration from ideas from mathematics and topology, where you can think about a tiling space as describing the same thing as the surface of a torus. So this is this idea from algebraic topology, where we can think of a torus just as taking a square and gluing the left side to the right side and the top side to the bottom side. But there are other ways that we can sort of create surfaces and glue them up. So one sort of classic example is the Klein model. So Klein model is this non-orientable surface, which is created very similarly topologically, except the left side connects to the right side of the square and the top side connects to the bottom side, but with a flip. So they're pointing opposite directions. And this is sort of similar to a Mobius strip, if you're familiar with that. And what you get is, a surface where there is no inside and outside. If you follow along one side long enough, you end up back on the inside. And so we said, what if we create a puzzle with this sort of topology? So not only do we get a puzzle that has sort of no beginning and end, but also now has no top and no bottom. Pieces from one side of the puzzle, you can flip them over which we're about to see in the video if I wasn't talking too fast. Yep, here we go, flipping it over and it can connect on the other side. Um, so we have sort of now one continuous image that's spanning across both sides of the puzzle. We took an image from the Hubble telescope of the Milky Way and we dubbed this the infinite galaxy puzzle. Um, and it's essentially like a, a puzzle with a topology of a Klein model. Every time you assemble it, it's gonna make a different image and a different shape of the galaxy. Um, we're really interested in seeing how we can apply new technology in simulation and fabrication to expand techniques uh, like this in traditional graphs. Oh, okay. there we go. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the last project of the lecture. Um, it's one of our most recent projects. Um, it's a collaboration with the Miller Laboratory at Rice University on developing 3D printed organs. Our projects, as you've seen, have historically been very inspired by nature, but this is the first time that we've actually gotten to apply our designs to make living things. This project started from one of our earliest works um, called Xylem back in 2010, which is looking at how leaves form their veins. And this is still sort of an active area of research. There are many different competing theories about how veins form. And one of sort of the most prominent ones is this theory in the middle called auxin flux canalization, which has to do with a growth hormone called auxin in plants. And it sort of has this feedback mechanism where where auxin flows is more likely to flow in the future. So you can kind of think of this like a river delta digging a trench. So you know, where it flows, it digs out more and is more likely to flow there in the future. And there's, our sort of work started based on this model by uh, Adam Runyon's at the University of Calgary, which created sort of a simplified version of this idea where you start with one vein and it sort of grows towards all of these hormone sources that are flowing towards it. And then every kind of vein just grows towards the average of all the things flowing towards it. And as it goes through, 
different branches form as different areas become exposed to flow. And you repeat this and you get this tree-like network. After implementing the system described by the paper, we started to play with it and explore it for design purposes. So we looked at different parameter spaces and ways of modifying the growth algorithm that produce sort of different typologies of networks. We uh, explore sort of mimicking different types of we've seen in nature, but also doing things which are unnatural and sort of physically impossible in nature, like this one labeled multi-root. What happens if you have a leaf that has many different starting points? Um, we also explore sort of varying density through space, creating like weird experiments in typography. And then ultimately we used to create a collection of stainless steel jewelry, which is photochemically etched called polium. Each one of these necklaces has a unique shape and a unique pattern of veins. Um, sort of on our website, we often translate our strange esoteric research into uh, everyday objects and products that most people can afford to buy. Um, so we're not really focused on the luxury market, we're instead focused on like normal everyday things. Um, when we're sort of studying these systems, we're not necessarily interested in exactly mimicking or copying nature, but to sort of understand and adapt the logic of these systems for creating structure and pattern and form for design. So we can start to explore sort of these completely unnatural scenarios. So we took leaf veination, which is in 2D, and we started playing with it in 3D, creating this collection of 3D printed lamps called hyphae, like leaves on a tree. Every lamp in the collection is unique. We also did some more complex 3D experiments, um, looking at like what happens if you take the system and grow it fully in 3D. And some of these structures ended up being sort of very difficult to understand, especially like through renderings or non-physical means. And we never really found a specific use case for these denser, more three-dimensional structures. We ended up just creating a series of sculptures for an art exhibit um, called Growing Objects. And we just put them up on our website and sort of stopped working on the project. Um, Until sort of uh, two or three years ago, we sort of got this cold call email from a researcher named Jordan Miller who said, I'm working on building 3D printers for living tissues, and I'm interested in using the structures and systems that you've developed to create actual living structures. So he created this system for printing live cells using stereolithography, which is a form of 3D printing that uses light to sort of solidify resin. Or in well, this yeah. case, he, he uses it to solidify hydrogel that has living cells suspended in it. So he sort of created a unique chemistry that's biocompatible, and then a projector based stereolithography printer that can print very super high resolution, intricate living structures. And his lab is sort of very focused on the idea of um, organ replacement in the future. So there's globally a huge shortage of compatible organs for organ replacement. And you know, why can't we just grow or print these organs? And another cool thing about his lab is he's been very involved in the RepRap community. So they make sort of all of their own tools and printers in-house and have shared a lot of their modifications of different plans in the RepRap community. So one of the challenges that his lab faces, though, is how do you keep these large constructs of living cells alive? If you're printing just a thin layer of cells, they can get nutrients and oxygen just from diffusion. However, our organs are very large and complex, and they have uh, solved this problem of getting oxygen and nutrients and throwing away waste through complex networks of blood vessels. And in order to create these sort of larger structures like they're trying to create, they need to have a way of generating these blood vessel structures. So that is what he challenged us to work on. So we started just exploring, you know, the hyphae system that we've already created and just kind of creating examples and asking like, how would these work? Are these printable? You know, what sort of structures are we looking to create for these vast natures? So this is a very early example 
uh, one of these structures printed in hydrogel. And then we started to work on this kind of this idea of, well, when we have a vascular network, you have veins and arteries where, you know, you have blood flowing in and blood coming out. So all of these structures need to have an inlet and an outlet that, you know, theoretically, if this was an organ, you could connect this with major veins and arteries. One of the things that was pretty strange along this entire process of working is we can generate things that are many orders of magnitude more complex than what they can actually print. Um, so it's a little, it's like really slow working. Like we would generate something and then we'd wait like a year basically. And then they would finally print something similar to sort of what we had generated. And it makes it very sort of hard to have a kind of iterative process and find out what works. I don't know if this is a video. No, it's not a video. So these are some very early things that uh, we created and printed. So just sort of emphasizing the point, so this is what we could design and this is what we could print. Yeah. <laughs> and some of these initial structures, they tested them and frankly, they, they didn't work very well. They didn't have great perfusion and flow. So you can see like sections of this didn't fill in with blood. You know, why is that? Is it due to defects in the printing, defects in the geometry, and that it's not promoting good flow? And this is something that we can't have in a structure that we want to keep alive. We need to have sort of equally distributed blood vessels that are keeping all of the cells in the structure alive. Um, so we worked on some uh, modifications to our algorithm in order to get better flow geometry and uh, interconnectivity between the inlets and the outlets. So this is a sort of modified algorithm, um, which we call mutual tree attraction, where as they're growing, they're not only growing towards the hormone sources, but they're being attracted to each other to form these closed loops. And then here's some examples of structures generated from that. A paper uh, actually just came out about this work. Uh, we This work about two weeks ago in Nature Biomedical Engineering And then sort of the next level of the challenge is creating structures with multiple networks. So most organs in our bodies are made of multiple interacting networks. So one of the simplest examples is your lung. You have an airway and you have blood vessels and the blood vessels sort of absorb oxygen from the airway and they have to intertwine and intermingle. Now, these are just some extremely naive initial renderings of like making two networks that can be in close proximity to each other. Um, but when we actually got started on working on a lung-like organ, uh, it seemed pretty important to just start studying lungs, how lungs are actually structured, how they work, um, so you, people have been fascinated with the function of lungs from sort of all time. We have a drawing from Leonardo da Vinci on the left there. On the right, we have sort of like the most modern day representation of lungs. Part of the problem is you can't actually see like down to the very smallest level of the capillaries. The lungs sort of have like a branching tree-like structure, which is the airway. And then they terminate in these little air sacs called the alveoli. And those alveoli are skinned in the tiniest, tiniest capillary nets. Um, which is where the blood becomes oxygenated while the air is pumping through the lungs. And another challenge is just that, you know, this imaging is all extremely difficult and it's hard to capture the whole picture. So you can get these sort of more macroscopic views and you can get these super, super zoomed in views, but it's hard to see how it all interacts together. Uh, we decided to work on a design for an alveolar-like unit that could be 3D printed using their technology. So alveoli are sheathed, like Jessica was saying, in these very tiny capillaries. Capillaries are, you know, like thinner than a human hair. They're super tiny blood vessels, which sort of form these nets. So we sort of started looking at different 
experiments in making different sort of net-like structures. We tested just some simple Voronoi-like structures and how they flow. And then ultimately what we created was this sort of anisotropic Voronoi-like structure where we take sort of a sheathing of this alveoli sac geometry and create a network that is distorted in the direction of fluid flow. So we're trying to sort of promote flow from the inlet to the outlet. So it's actually essentially a directional sort of Voronoi net that goes wrapping around this bulbous structure. And then ultimately what we're interested in is the possibility of connecting up these sort of unit cells, these alveoli-like units into a hierarchical network that could be used to flow both air and blood. So we actually need sort of three networks. We need the air network, we need a blood inlet and a blood outlet. The sort of, it gets, it gets a little complicated as you can see in this animation, we created a modification of our HIFI system that allows us to grow a branching airway in an arbitrary volume. So sort of whatever volume they need to generate a lung-like structure in, then we can grow networks for the blood inlet and outlet that entwine around that airway. And then we can instantiate these um, alveolar units, which we have designed and tested on the ends of this network to create a sort of functioning mini artificial organ. Now, once again, this is sort of like orders beyond what they can do. We've designed this entire system for laying out many of these things through space, um, but currently, where the system is at is creating and testing single units. So this is um, the alveolar unit that we designed with Jordan Miller at Rice. Um, and what you see flowing through there is um, living human red blood cells. And um, it's being well inflated and deflated in order to oxygenate the human blood cells. And that's how big it is, in case you were curious. It's, it's pretty small, but it's still like several times larger than a real alveoli. What's been really great about this project is it's a truly collaborative effort and it's been really a constant dialogue, um, exploring what we can do with these new technologies. So both the new fabrication technology that lets us work with living cells, but also the generative techniques that we've um, pioneered at Nervous System. And we've pushed Jordan's team to sort of print and explore more and more complex geometry than ever before. And they've pushed us to create sort of new ideas and learn new techniques that we can apply to create this uh, geometry. And ultimately going forward, we hope to create sort of open tools that researchers across the globe can use to do tissue engineering and apply generative techniques to the biosciences and bioengineering. And we were really, really lucky that this got um, the cover of science um, so this uh, paper is available online. Uh, the title is up there. And I think we've reached the end of our talk here. We move to the Catskills. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hopefully we didn't ramble on too long. And I believe now we're going to have questions, which we'd be happy to answer. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica and Jesse, for a great presentation. It's really amazing to see the work in perspective and uh, to see you present through uh, the past hour. So uh, thanks again for that. We do have some questions coming in and I'd like to remind our uh, audience that uh, you can ask a question either by posting it in the Q&A box. You can see the small Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or you can uh, use the raise hand tool to be promoted to panelists and ask your question live on video. So we have a question here from Niels who's asking, uh, which are your main software or coding tools? I feel like there's a lot of coding behind what, you're, what you do. Uh, and number two is how does the quarantine affected, how did the quarantine affect your uh, creative process? Well, we use many different programming languages. So we do create all of our own software. Um, 
we started out before Grasshopper existed and both of us sort of have a traditional background in programming. So we're sort of not visual programmers. We're just sort of like old school programmers. We started out um, many years ago using processing, but now we primarily use C++ when we're programming things that are sort of um, resource intensive or we use JavaScript when we're doing things that are for the web. Um, yeah, we write a lot of things from scratch. We also use a lot of tools from the creative coding community. We use a lot of open frameworks. We also use tools from the scientific community, uh, libraries like CGAL, which is a computational geometry algorithms library for uh, you know, sort of numeric libraries. There's something called Eigen, which is used for matrix computation. There's sort of an endless litany of tools that I could go into, but that's a little bit too much detail. How has the quarantine affected our creative process? Well, we've been, since we, as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, we just moved to a new studio. We've been very focused on just getting set up and um, getting our studio going in a new place. Um, I feel like we haven't had as much time in the past few months to focus on creative projects because we've had to really focus on like building and architecture and hiring and getting set up. But we're finally starting to get that under control and getting to focus on some creative work again. And we're pretty much introverted hermits anyway. So from that perspective, being isolated during a global pandemic is not that different from our normal way of working. Yeah, and in general, our studio is very self-directed, so quarantine hasn't affected us that much in terms of like project cancellations or things like that. It's mostly just affected us in terms of just making anything that you do more difficult, like getting supplies or delayed. And yeah, for instance, uh, we couldn't buy a webcam for this. <laughs> meeting because like all webcams are sold out. I, I had the same issue when we started Live Academy, so I had to order mine online. <laughs> but yeah, um, and, and someone actually commented on the staircase uh, railing that you guys have worked on. And she was saying, it's great that you, you managed to finish that uh, given the circumstances. Did you start that project during quarantine or was it something that you've worked on before and then managed to just get it done with. Yeah, that, that actually got finished right before this whole quarantine business started. So that probably got done in February or maybe the beginning of March. Um, so we designed like a, a large perforated railing that goes from the ground level of our new building and then all along the mezzanine on the second floor. I don't know, it's maybe 50 feet long, something like that, maybe longer. And it sort of has variable patterns across the whole thing. And it's laser cut from steel, um, which is sort of, we don't tend to work on many things that are, you can't hold in your hand. So uh, it's interesting to make a bigger thing. And then also that we get to live with and work with every day. So that was a, a personally commissioned project. It was a self-initiated project, so to speak, right? Yeah, it's sort of one, we didn't splurge on that many things for the construction of our building. Um, most things we sort of took like, the the cheapest option, but we splurged on designing and fabricating our own handrail and then a few other things. That's a good investment. It's also some, some, something to show to your clients if they ever come to visit. Yeah, nobody's ever coming. So. <laughs> uh, Alicia's uh, saying, fascinating. Thanks. Uh, do you write your own software? Which programs do you use? I think Jesse uh, alluded to that. Do you print your... Uh, do you, do you print, do, have you delved into printing, uh, 3D printing metal uh, using SLS? So we have, we don't do our own metal 3D printing. Uh, we don't have the machines for that in-house. We have machines in-house, basically just form labs printers. So we can use those to print plastics and rubber. And we have done a lot of work with printing ceramic in-house. So we have kilns, um, but for metals, we outsource. SLS metal is extremely expensive. So unless it's a project that really has to be in steel and it needs to be high detail, we normally wouldn't use SLS for printing. Um, we do a lot with cast metals. Um, we have done some in-house too of printing wax and then we set up like a little miniature foundry um, with a furnace so we can cast small like brass and bronze objects in-house. 
But for the necklaces, uh, you said it's uh, they're made out of uh, stainless steel. You uh, laser cut those or water jet them? Those are uh, photochemically etched. So it's similar to how circuit boards are made. You have a sheet of steel and it has a resistive material applied to it using light. So a light sensitive resist is applied and then it's exposed to hydrochloric acid, which eats through the areas which are not exposed. So it's actually, it's much, much cheaper than laser cutting. This is just a passive process. You don't have machine time. You don't have to trace out every hole. Just acid eats right through. That's amazing. So it's a really cool process. We don't do that ourselves. No, I don't <laughs> like to work with hydrochloric acid in my personal space. Dangerous. Uh, John Four is saying natural systems are known for having very high levels of efficiency. Can you observe these uh, in your studies of natural forms in terms of uh, material efficiency amongst others? So I guess the question is, have, you know, I think you showed a lot of examples of that. Every, almost every project that you've shown throughout your presentation had a sort of uh, uh, the research behind it. Uh, I, was, I was especially fascinated with the research behind the puzzle making. I mean, I wasn't aware the puzzle making was such a intricate craft and it had like sort of a lineage that we kind of uh, lost, uh, uh, as you said, uh, Jesse, with, uh, with mass manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, efficiency, material efficiency is certainly important, especially like when you're running a company that's making products, like they need to be affordable and efficient to make. Um, but I would say it is often not the, the goal or endpoint of most of our projects. It's sort of more about um, expression and interactivity than achieving some sort of like apex goal of like the most efficient design possible. I mean... I sort of maybe have a bit of a contentious view of, you know, a lot of people talk about biomimicry like it's some sort of optimization problem, but for the most part, nature doesn't actually optimize things and lots of things in nature can be extremely inefficient if, you know, resources are plenty and sort of what nature tends to do is it just finds something that works and if that lives then it just keeps going so for instance like the ammonite is one of these examples of you know we don't really know it's hard to imagine that these sort of structures are actually efficient especially like compared to a nautilus which is super simple and elegant well, i mean it did go extinct it, it did <laughs> so <laughs> there's not a conclusive argument here but yeah, yeah. i Often our, our designs and our systems are not like intended to be the most efficient necessarily, but more like the most expressive and interactive and open to uh, our customers and other people to play and interact with. And maybe that's even also like another sort of point about nature is that it's not necessarily about being efficient, it's about being robust. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the, the peacock's feathers, for example, I mean, there, there's, is, is that, a, a, you know, it's probably not the most efficient way to have a feather, but, you know, the beauty behind it is also a survival technique, so to speak. There was actually a peacock in our yard a couple of weeks ago. Three peacocks just showed up in our backyard. We're like, where did these peacocks come from? Because peacocks. apparently a thing that can happen. You guys are living in paradise. It's, it's <laughs> Uh, Rumsey is asking in your pro in your last project, uh, did you test how well the uh, lung uh, oxygenated the blood? So there were were there any results from uh, the the experiment? Uh, yes, they did test all sorts of things which are scientifically relevant. We're not super involved in that part of the project, but there's write ups in the paper on that. They tested them in living rats. So I don't know, they took like rats that were sick with like liver damage, and then they used uh, the printed structures with the blood vessels in them in order to like prolong the rats' lives for some number of weeks. So they've done a lot of studies and they study the degree of oxygenation and they study the cells and how they survive over time in these aggregate structures, but we're not um, doing that portion of it. We're really just focused on the geometry. The design. They also sort of compared different oxygenation rates of sort of more sort of engineered structures. Yeah. Com compared to the more sort of biomimetic structures, which we generate. So they, yeah, they've been looking at a lot of different things. And uh, there's two papers out now which go into a lot of detail on that. They 
little bit dense and difficult to read sometimes with all the scientific jargon, but it is interesting. Really cool. Anonymous is asking, can you talk about your background in biology, how your background in biology has influenced your design process? For people interested in this type of work, do you recommend taking courses in biology? Well, I study biology and I study it because I've always just been super fascinated in the things that we talked about today, basically how does structure and form and pattern emerge in nature? Our biology is super weird and complex. It's like the most complex technology on the planet. And it goes from like a single cell to something as complex as a human being all through its own mechanisms. So that's why I studied it. How does it actually apply to the work that I do? I don't know. It's a long I mean, time ago at this point, but I mean, if it excites you and you're interested in it, I say definitely take classes in it and see where it takes you. That's why I studied biology. Good place. It's, it's hard to say about, like, um, you know, I studied math, but I don't necessarily think that math directly impacts our work either. Like, we've been doing this since we were both students, so we've kind of been doing it for our entire lives, so it's sort of like we have developed sort of the knowledge about these things as we've been going, not necessarily sort of started from some particular set of classes that you could point to or books to read necessarily. Uh, Niels has another question. What would you design if you would live on Mars? <laughs> Do you have any space traveling thoughts? I don't know. I'm not super pro space travel. I sort of fall into the camp of people that's like we live on the best planet like that we know about by far that has like an atmosphere and like millions of years of like ecological relationships that work and provide this incredible diversity. Like I have no interest in going to a planet with no air and no nutrients and like totally inhospitable to human life. We should save the planet we're on. That's the camp I fall into. So I don't know. I don't have any advanced advice for going to Mars. What about you, Jesse? Do you share the same thing? <laughs> so we have a question from the host who couldn't post it on the Q and A, or I think it's it's, it's somewhere from my team. It might be Jad. So he's saying, "Amazing lecture, thank you." Have you considered printing in flexible materials? Yes, we have considered printing in flexible materials. They're not super accessible yet. So a lot of the work we've done with New Balance involves printing yeah, with flexible, which I didn't show, but um, that involves printing with flexible materials. We've done a lot of work on um, midsoles and some work on uppers for shoes, and that can be printed in various. Um, initially, we worked in like TPU, which is a powder that's fused by lasers. And later we worked with light cured, like, resin rubbers um which are more like polyurethane and yeah, a lot of the, the sort of off the shelf flexible materials that you can print now aren't really robust enough for any use products but there are a lot of people developing flexible materials that are more robust for instance the work with new balance that we're doing they're working with form labs and form labs have developed sort of a specific material for their use that is a flexible, printable material, but it's also much more difficult to work with. Involves not just as plug and play as sort of the the off the shelf materials that they sell. I mean, I don't know if it's just because we've been, we've been working with three D printing for so long now, but we sort of lost our um, passion for plastic and plastic like materials. So in the past few years, we've been working a lot more with ceramic. We started doing some like in-house production of porcelain objects where we like 3D print components for molds and then produce traditional plaster molds from that. So really there's just like one part that's in plastic, that initial investment in the design piece. And then we can um, reach, produce more pieces just in sort of more earth-friendly materials like ceramic and porcelain. Um, sort of less, increasingly less excited about making 3D printed plastic crap, um, although we still produce some of that. Do you uh, cast the ceramic in a uh, plastic mold or 
It's you... it's cast in a plaster molds. They're sort of like a series of uh, interchanges. So we start with some plastic parts. We use that to make a rubber master mold. The rubber master mold can then be used to make plaster molds. And we can keep making like more and more plaster molds. And from the plaster molds, we make porcelain parts. Very interesting. Uh, someone is asking, how big is your team right now? And how has it grown over time? The uh, size of our team has been very up and down. Right now we have seven people. Is that right? Sounds great. Something like seven people right now. Um, I think the largest we've ever been is maybe 12 people. And for most of the first years, it was just the two of us. Um, so many years we just worked by ourselves and then we started hiring part-time assistants to help us with fabrication work and shipping we run our own like we do our own fabrication for a lot of things and we run our own shipping and fulfillment so we need a lot of help with that and then over the years when we were in boston we got sort of more established and we had more staff we had like a studio manager and we had another programmer who worked with us and a lot of fabrication staff and then once we moved to the catskills we went back down to just two of us for like a whole year while we were under construction mm -hmm. and then now we've sort of been hiring people again we have one programmer slash illustrator um one programmer slash fabricator the two of us and then like three or four part-time uh, fabrication and shipping assistants. I don't really, we don't really want to get too big. I found that when we had 12 people, we spent way too much time managing people and Jesse and I didn't have a chance to do anything interesting anymore. Um, so that's sort of always a struggle. And it's mostly probably just about our personal management techniques and how we actually work, but we prefer to have a smaller studio. Fair enough. I mean, we had a very interesting conversation with Chris Precht about that, and he shares, and also Arthur, uh, who I know you're, you're friends with as well, uh, and they, they all share the same perspective that, you know, growing bigger for certain, you know, aspects of your, of, of your ethos as a company is not necessarily always a good thing. Um, so we have a question from Anonymous here asking, you spoke about uh, making tool sets accessible. Can you speak a little about the role uh, of design and research, uh, the role that design and research can play in making a more equitable environment, making more equitable environments for people? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's a hard question. Hmm. I mean, I think, Obviously the goal in creating these sort of open tools is to make it so more people can design their own stuff and design stuff that works for them and that's specific to their needs. I don't think we're anywhere close to like that being like useful and like actual. We're still like a very small segment of the market. We make things that aren't necessarily, you know, like, well, I don't know. Some of the things we make, frankly, they're frivolous. So I don't know. I mean, we're we're pretty pessimistic and critical people, both of us. So I mean, I would like to think that by doing this, we can create a world that is more equitable. Equitable, but I don't know if actually anything that we're doing is making a difference. I do sometimes think that the work we're doing at Nervous System has inspired other companies to take a similar approach. So sometimes I think that even though we're very small and we don't do very much. Like we've provided an example of how you can run a company that focuses on making like one of a kind customized things instead of mass produced things. And then that can lead to better products that are more useful for more people. But I don't know. Wouldn't you say your most recent project or the last project that you showed in your presentation, uh, uh, you know, wouldn't you say that made a difference in the world somehow? I mean, that's that's a very... That's definitely not a frivolous project. I wouldn't describe it as such. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's there's like many different ways in which you could come up with ideas to make artificial organs in the future. Like, is this going to be the one that is going to like take hold? Like, I have no idea. But it's it's like an, it's an approach that has some merit. I don't know. There may be other approaches that are are better in the future. I'm not sure. Yeah, and it's it's like very long term, you know. We're not going to be printing replacement organs anytime in the next 
at least five years. <laughs> hmm. Replacement yeah. organs for rats <laughs> and mice. Well, that's a good start. Uh, Anonymous is asking, do you ship these custom-made online products worldwide, or do you have specific regions where you ship them? I'm particularly interested in the puzzle, actually. I might invest in one for sure. <laughs> we do ship worldwide, although warning, international shipping is terrible, and if you don't pay for the more expensive shipping, your item may get lost in the mail for like two months before you see it. Um, especially these days. Especially these days with the coronavirus, shipping restrictions, things have been taking a long time. Uh, someone's asking, uh, is most of your research funded by selling your products? Yes, that is one thing that people find extremely strange. We're not independently wealthy and we're not a startup and we don't have investors. We just do a totally normal small business thing of making things, selling them, and then taking the money and using it to make our studio better. That's really so it's just been a very slow process of starting out from, you know, working out of our apartment and making enough money to have a studio. And then ultimately now we just built this like facility, um, which is going to be our permanent home from sort of the proceeds of making a lot of jigsaw puzzles, I'm being honest. It's really, so, really, I mean, I'd assume that uh, you're supporting yourselves with your teaching gigs. But, um, it's awesome. No, to no. The teaching gig I just sort of took for fun because it's good to get out of the office sometimes. It's not really like a significant source of income. Um, so that's awesome. Um, Alicia is saying you've been inspiring a lot of artists. And with that uh, nice note, we'll, we'll end our talk today. So thanks again, Jesse and Jessica. Thank you so much for your time. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people. And we will be putting out this recording on YouTube tomorrow. So uh, thanks for your time and for sharing your beautiful works. And uh, we hope uh, that we see you again. Thanks for having us. Nice seeing you again. <laughs>